Welcome to the future and you. This episode is for May 25, 2011. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. This is the 200th episode of The Future and You. To celebrate this little milestone, I've asked the listeners and some of the past guests to send me their own predictions of the future. I would thought I might talk a little bit about how the show came to be, how I almost got an interview with Arthur C. Clarke, how I managed to get an interview with a presidential candidate, and some other behind-the-scenes anecdotes. But I got a lot more responses than I expected. That stuff might have to wait. There may not be time enough for it. Over about a week, I emailed many of the guests I've interviewed during the last five years and asked for a prediction I could read into the show. Having done the show for over five years, some of the emails were no longer in use and bounced. But most were still good, and many guests responded. Here is approximately what I emailed to them. I customized it based on how well I knew them. Hi, thanks again for being one of the guests on my show, The Future and You. My next episode will be the 200th. I'm planning a special episode in which I will read predictions by past guests. If you would, please email me a prediction of the future. Just a paragraph or two is plenty, or several paragraphs if you're in the mood. Especially good would be a prediction based on a trend most people have been ignoring or just not aware of. Thanks, Steve. Some had to decline thanks to deadlines, such as Robert J. Sawyer and Peter S. Beagle, and also Cory Doctorow for medical reasons. Uh, He had uh, surgery recently, and he's recovering. Uh, Also, I'm not going to try to provide much biographical uh, info here, because there are just so many people. Here they are in approximately the order I received them, except that I'll start with a few short ones. Larry Niven, the award-winning author of Ringworld, The Mode in God's Eye, and many other hard science fiction novels, He provides three predictions. The first, the first of the United States to send condemned criminals to the organ banks will be Florida. His second prediction, privacy will have been a passing fad. And his third, printed books will become a market aimed mainly at collectors. That was from Larry Niven. Joe Haldeman, whose most famous novel is The Forever War, which was inspired by his Vietnam experiences and won both the Hugo and Nebula Awards. He wrote... People will get fed up with dirty politics and, through remorselessly audited disclosures, will only elect good men and women. When nothing gets done, they'll fire them and go back to the old crooks. That was from Joe Haldeman. Frederick Pohl, author of Gateway, the classic science fiction novel which won the Nebula, Hugo, Campbell, and Locus Awards, he wrote, There are any number of things I'd like to say about the reasonably near future, say, about 50 years from now, like whether human beings will be living on Mars, the Moon, or any other body, not the Earth, parentheses, he wrote, they won't. Computers have become capable of fruitful conversations with human, also in parentheses, he wrote, they won't either. We're still transforming food, parentheses, corn, into fuel, ethanol, we won't be. Everyone will own his or her own little house on half an acre of land, parentheses, not in the cards, or the Chicago Cubs and the New York Mets will win consecutive World Series, parentheses, don't make me weep. But I'll confine myself to a single prediction, which will be about the weather 50 years from now, because that strongly affects everything else. So here goes. By 2060 AD, the whole Sun Belt that stretch of land from Texas to Southern California, will be so drought-ridden as to be practically a desert. The tornado belt will include lower parts of Canada and much of Florida. Bangladesh and other low-lying areas will be under shallow ocean waters. But things won't get much worse because when the weather starts turning really bad, the people will realize that burning oil, coal, or other fossil fuels are really deadly and will stop believing the publicity from the fossil fuel people in time to avoid irreversible disaster. That was from Frederick Pohl. Fred's wife, Betty Hall, also wrote, Stephen, congratulations on the 200th show. Quite a milestone. Next is Catherine Asaro. Hers is a little bit longer, and it has a title, Methuselah Awakening. By the way, she is a science fiction and fantasy author best known for her books about the Ruby Dynasty, called the Saga of the Scolian Empire. She is also a physicist and former ballerina. Her prediction, 
human lifespans have increased dramatically. During the Bronze and Iron Ages, the average lifespan was roughly 26 years. By the 20th century, it had risen to 30 to 45 years. Currently, it's about 67. It isn't uncommon to see senior citizens these days with lives as action-packed as those of people half their age in earlier eras. We're on the verge of unraveling why we age. Some scientists have predicted that ultimately we might live centuries, even thousands of years. If anyone can live for hundreds of years, the Earth won't be able to support our population without drastic changes in how we live. The pressure to control who has access to longevity treatments could become immense, as will the drive to expand beyond our world. Laws might be passed about who can have a family. The decision of who is allowed to live for a long time could become intensely politicized. Human culture might well separate into a dramatically tiered society that makes the gaps of today look mild in comparison. On one side will be a long-lived, wealthy, influential population. On the other side will be everyone else. Older generations will accumulate more and more financial power, those with the wisdom to invest well. Buying power will become more concentrated in the hands of older, savvier groups that few businesses in our current economy know how to effectively reach. Those with political power will continue to build their influence over centuries, cementing the power of their position in society. The risk of stagnation increases if those set in their ways can live for centuries. The gap between young and old will intensify until populations bifurcate into subcultures with almost no overlap. If you grew up in the 1950s and are living in 2100, will you even understand the language, culture, or mores of teens? The young take for granted advances that can baffle their elders. That phenomena might become so pronounced that substantially different generations can't operate in the same society. Your great-grandparents, with their wary distrust of cell phones, might be literally unable to accompany you into the virtual reality where you operate in a self-designed universe unlike anything they've ever imagined. However, others among the older generation will adapt easily. Young people may know the lingo, tech, and styles of their generation in a way their elders can't understand, but they will also be competing against people with centuries more experience. We already live in a world where it can take years of college to learn the skills needed to succeed in many professions. In the future, will it even be possible for our youth to enter segments of the workforce dominated by experts who have been developing their skills for centuries? transition education could become the norm. On one side, older generations will be offered formalized programs to bring them up to speed on developments in technology and culture. On the other, institutions will offer programs to help the young succeed in an increasingly layered society, much in the way that modern colleges formalized the apprentice-expert relationship of earlier cultures. The age of maturity will come later in life. Early in human history, people were often considered adults after they went through puberty and could have their own children. Nowadays, 18 or 21 is the norm. That number will rise as the sophistication needed to operate in our culture increases. Someday, 25-year-olds will be, quote, kids. The prime of life will be an age our ancestors considered old, ancient, or just plain dead. If people remain young in appearance and healthy into substantially older years, it will throw a monkey wrench in accepted norms of social interaction. If you don't know that the hot chick you met at the Holo Arcade is your great-grandmother's age, it could lead to complications our ancestors never imagined. It's going to be a fascinating, thorny, complex time to be alive, and it's coming fast. That was from Catherine Asaro. Next is Harry Turtledove. Harry Turtledove is an award-winning science fiction and fantasy author, best known for his novels of alternate history. He holds a Ph.D. from UCLA in Byzantine history. He wrote, Steve, the future will look an awfully lot like the past. People will fight with one another and do stupid things that their neighbors, and sometimes even they themselves, will realize are stupid at the time, but they'll go ahead and do them anyway. They'll keep discovering new things and keep discovering new ways to use the things and ideas they already have, many of which will horrify large segments of the population. They'll be like the little girl with the curl. 
When they're good, they'll be very, very good, and when they're bad, you'd better run like hell. That's from Harry Turtledove. Next, Gregory Benford. Gregory Benford is a Nebula Award-winning author, physicist, and professor. He wrote, I predict we will finally, in the 2010s, get the benefits from the genomic revolution that started a decade ago. We'll get more rapid increases in genomically derived products that can extend our lifespans and our well spans, years gained for greater productive life. I'm working on this in my company, Genescient, and we're happy to take part. That's from Gregory Benford. I've talked to him very briefly about Genescient on the show, uh, but you can learn more about it by looking it up, uh, doing a search of it online. It's spelled G-E-N-E-S-C-I-E-N-T. Next is John Varley. John Varley is a science fiction and fantasy author. To me, he's most famous for his uh, Gaia trilogy of novels, Titan, Wizard, and Demon. He has won the Hugo Award three times, the Nebula Award twice, and the Locus Award ten times. He wrote, Hi, Steve. I've never bought into the idea that SF writers are any better at predicting things than, for instance, the yearly panel for the National Enquirer. We can predict things that are obvious to a scientist, though not to the general public, such as that one day a rocket will take us to the moon. But we missed the fact that we would stop going there for 40 years. We missed transistors and lasers. We shouldn't feel bad about that. Scientists missed transistors and lasers, too, until somebody made the breakthrough. However, since I'm writing this on the fateful day of May 21st, 2011, sitting here waiting for the world to end, I will make three predictions that I absolutely guarantee. Bet your savings on them. 1. In years to come, someone will set a date for the end of the world. 2. Some people will quit their jobs and give all their money away. 3. The prediction will not come to pass. I know, too easy, but it's the best I can do. John Farley. Next is Extrapia da Silva, my one and only guest who is a digital person who exists only inside the virtual world of Second Life. Her prediction, PlayStation 1 had insufficient graphics power to achieve facial animation. Typical in-game cutscenes would involve characters waving their hands about animatedly while maintaining a totally fixed expression with zero lip movement. Now fast forward to the latest generation of game consoles, and we see dramatic improvement in the ability to perform lip sync and fully expressive facial features. I predict future generations of sensors like Kinect, which is spelled K-I-N-E-C-T, will bring a real-time capture of facial movements, thereby enabling avatars to convey emotions in a totally naturalistic way. This video of the technology behind an upcoming video game, L.A. Noir, shows the current state of the art in in-game facial animation. Uh, she provides a link here, but it's very complicated with lots of little characters. Uh, you can watch it if you search YouTube for the phrase L.A. Noir Tech Trailer. And I'm going to spell that since noir is French, and most people, even the French, probably can't spell it. It's spelled L-A space N-O-I-R-E space dash space T-E-C-H space T-R-A-I-L-E-R. I've got two CJs, so I put them back to back. First, C.J. Cherry. C.J. Cherry is a science fiction and fantasy author, She's written more than 60 books, including the Hugo Award-winning novels Down Below Station and Psy Teen, both set in her Alliance Union universe. She wrote, I'm not a dystopian, quite the contrary. I see a trend toward filtering the info that reaches you to suit your preferences, so you are never jarred by a, quote, blue or, quote, red piece of news that would burst your little bubble or info cocoon. I see a contrary trend of ninja information finding ways to crack the info cocoon you may have created, so that either information or propaganda can't reach you with the intent of cracking such bubbles, the info cocoon equivalent of nuisance callers, only in this instance perhaps on the side of the angels. 
using the very criteria that screen information such bots could target counter info and render any cocoon an open invitation to invasion. In an era when people don't want to be presented with information that challenges their world views, careful crafting of the information could render it more subtle and more effective. That was from C.J. Cherry. The next C.J. is C.J. Henderson. C.J. Henderson is a writer of horror, hard-boiled crime fiction, and comic books. His best-known work in the hard-boiled genre is Jack Hagee, detective series, and his supernatural detective, Teddy London series. He wrote, As I gaze into my crystal ball, I follow a timeline through the hideous morass we call our daily lives to a moment somewhere several years from now when a violent branching takes place. Humanity, it seems, will take one path or the other. Either we will, due to some unknowable event, rise up as one and pull down all those in power, casting them into the streets, hanging them from lamp posts, every senator and president, every mayor and council person, every dictator, king, monarch, premier, CEO, congressperson, prince, comptroller, judge, lawyer, and any others that might fit the bill, leaving them there to rot and stand as reminders that evil will inevitably be punished as warnings to those who would rule us afterward that we have awakened and will no longer submit to their petty whims any longer as our lives become a never-ending picnic of satisfied freedom. Or we will take the other path, where we allow the above to finally strangle the last bit of life out of us, leaving our flaccid, beer-soaked bodies in front of our televisions, our right hands deadly clicking our remotes so that our glazed-over eyes might flicker on with false memories of being entertained. It's one or the other. Uh, I think he's being a little melodramatic in that. Uh, that was from C.J. Henderson. Next is from David Orban. David Orban is an entrepreneur, visionary, and analyst of the global high-technology landscape. He writes, Hi, Stephen. This is wonderful. Congratulations for the milestone, and thanks for thinking of me. Here is my thought. The evolution in the understanding of the nature of risk and an increasingly sound management of it is going to be possible and necessary in the future. It will enable better and more varied decision-making by individuals, groups, and society as a whole, opening up entirely new classes of behavior and plans inaccessible before. Our knowledge of facts in a complex world is not enough without a dynamic picture which puts them in perspective. The very foundation of our concept of free will is based on the assumption that we can act on facts, favorably influencing the outcome of previously indeterminate causal chains. The choices we make depend on our capacity to grasp rationally the consequences of our behavior. We are free to destroy positive futures, and it is our responsibility to make everything possible so that this does not happen. Public debates on the allocation of resources avoiding the downsides of technologies whose contours are still uncertain while maintaining the upside of the broad benefits of their mainstream application are going to be more rational, transparent, and accountable. The reason is relatively simple. A generalized law of accelerating returns doesn't only apply to the mere design of hardware embodied by Moore's law, or its cousins in storage or software. It expresses itself in the design of policies and the structure of society itself, which can be a burden on innovation and on the search of novel solutions, or greatly facilitate them. Those societies which foster rational debates and policies will be fitter and will prosper. Individuals in a society which must be more and more ready to support their most basic needs are going to live longer and more varied lives accustomed to take advantage of a growing spectrum of freedoms and opportunities where the risks taken through personal initiative will be mitigated and accepted as a necessary component in the search of futures worth building. Best, David Orban. Next is Dave Freer. Dave Freer is a science fiction author writing mostly humorous or alternate history novels. He lives in South Africa. He writes... The future will be what we don't expect. We've actually passed through the steam and heavy engineering period, into the chemical period, into the electronic period, and now into the computing period. 
each of which at best were predicted peripherally and with vision heavily colored by the previous period. So I'm going to venture a guess that the next period will not be information technology slash singularity, parentheses, because of certain limiting factors, like the intellect of the wetware, unparentheses, or the nanotechnology one, parentheses, because of the physical constraints on making myriads of mechanical nano devices and the fact that nanoscale is, well, really small. So if you have a bucket of nanobots, you have several billion, and they have multiples of the resource needs, very small ability to move, uh, a second nested parentheses, work out how many times its own length a nanobot has to move to travel one centimeter. Then work out the power requirements to move any body that many times its own length, and you start to hit on some of the problems of looking at nanotechnology through big engineering eyes. They have purposes, but if you want to dig holes, you're better off with a steam shovel. Close parentheses. I think, in fact, the next period will be the microbiological era and will hinge on the ability to splice genes into unicellular organisms and to use their natural ability to reproduce by binary fission, which, given our control over limiting factors, means we can use exponential growth. I also feel that the next century will be dominated not by the country that can muster the men at arms or conventional weapons of today, or hold presently used non-renewable resources, but to the country that breaks the old worldview mold that changes the science dynamic, the country that farms brains and innovation, the country that harnesses photosynthesis as an energy source, that figures out how to use nuclear power without using it to first heat water and turn turbines, which is 19th century technology. The country whose scientists look at the way things are done and deliberately focus on doing something else, as Columbus did sailing west when everyone else sailed east, as Galileo did when he proposed the earth moved around the sun and not the other way around. That's the real future. That's from Dave Freer. Next is Julio Prisco, futurist, business consultant, essayist, and public speaker. Hi, Stephen. I am honored to be quoted in the 200th episode. You are really doing excellent work. How about this? My long-term predictions are as optimist as ever. I am confident that we will develop human empowerment technologies, such as radical life extension, mind uploading, and synthetic realities. I am confident that we will go back to space, back to the moon, and then onwards to Mars and to the stars. I am confident that those who wish will someday have the option of leaving biology behind, move to new, higher performance substrates, and beam themselves to the galaxies. Sadly, my short-term predictions are far less optimistic, at least as far as the future of our Western society is concerned. I see that we are becoming old, ossified, with far too much obsession for safety, control, and political correctness, like old people afraid of their own shadows in a safe, PC, and sad retirement home. If this trend continues, we will cease to be relevant, and other cultures, younger and more dynamic, will take the lead. I see, but perhaps this is wishful thinking, also some counter-trends, WikiLeaks, the pirate parties, New spiritual movements such as TerraSam, citizen scientists, file sharing, do-it-yourself tech movements, citizens everywhere beginning to realize that we must take the power back in our hands and build the future that we dreamed of in the 1960s. In the 60s, we used to think of 2011 as, quote, the future, unquote. Now I realize that the 60s were the future, and later we as a society have lost our imagination and let nanny state control freaks take us back to the past. Let's go back to the 60s, back to the future, and onward to the stars. But it's going to take some work. That was from Julio Prisco. This one is by Mike Resnick. He's a popular science fiction and fantasy author. He was also formerly executive editor of Jim Bain's Universe magazine, which means he was for some time my boss. Because his prediction is about the, uh, the publishing industry, uh, I want to tell just a wee bit about his background. He has won five Hugo Awards and has won numerous other awards. He's also edited anthologies and done a lot of other work in the industry. And so for him to make this prediction is particularly noteworthy. Now here's the, here's the prediction from Mike Resnick. 
I think at least one, and possibly as many as three major publishers will be sued into bankruptcy via class action suits for lying on royalty statements, because with the advent of e-books, those lies have become much easier to prove. Short but sweet. This next one is from Michael Anisimov. He is currently media director for the Singularity Institute. He's also a futurist, essayist, and public speaker. Hi, Stephen. My prediction would be that the first prototypes for full-body haptic suits, and for those unfamiliar with the word, haptic is spelled H-A-P-T-I-C, haptic suits, will appear in the early 2020s. Using embedded sensors and actuators, these will allow us to touch, and he puts touch in quotes, to touch virtual objects and take the virtual world to a new level. All the best, Michael Anisimov. The next one is from David Brin. David Brin is a science fiction author who has won the Hugo, Locus, Campbell, and Nebula Awards. He writes, Hi, Stephen. My capsule forecast? That a movement will arise among radicalized moderates in emerging nations seeking the return of hundreds of billions looted by their former rulers. This movement will transform into a general worldwide campaign against secrecy, portraying it as the underlying thing that empowers every evil. For more of my predictions, see this site where fans have tracked my predictions. And he gives a rather long link. The basis of it, however, is um, Earth by David Brin. That's all one word, and I'm going to spell it. Uh, Earth by David Brin. E-A-R-T-H-B-Y-D-A-V-I-D-B-R-I-N. The description for that is, This wiki intends to track predictions and descriptions of the future made by scientist, technology pundit, and science fiction author David Brin. Uh, He also mentions, The concept of filter bubbles seems quoted directly from my 1990 novel, Earth. And there's a link to that from Slashdot. The Rise of Filter Bubbles is the title of it. That was from David Brin. Cory Doctorow, the science fiction author, wrote, My regrets. I've just had hip surgery with a very long recovery. As a result, I'm not able to give this the attention it deserves. I'm not adding anything else to my cue until I'm fully recovered. Thanks for understanding, Cory. Barry Hayworth is a listener who has written in before. He writes, Dear Steve, have very much enjoyed your podcast over the years. Keep up the good work. Here are some comments from me about your podcast. And he signs it, Barry Hayworth, from Brisbane, Australia. He has a tagline at the bottom of all his emails. It says, I am a statistician. One false move, and you're a statistic. G'day, Steve. Barry Howarth from Brisbane, Australia here wanting to say congratulations on reaching your 200th episode. I've been a listener to your podcast for a fair few years now. Uh, Some years back I was uh, looking up some stuff about Vernor Vinge and a web search took me to some of the interviews that you had recorded on your podcast. I downloaded the episodes in question and, well, liked what I heard so much that I went back and downloaded all the other available episodes too. This was back in the days when you were um, structuring your episodes as in, with multiple interviews in each episode and individual in, interviews split up between more than one episode. I must say that I do prefer your current system of putting everything, putting a, a single interview per episode. Makes it easier to uh, keep track of, uh, of individual interviews and of course it, uh, having the episodes shorter and in more digestible chunks makes them makes them that much better too. That was also back when you were serialising your novel. Um, because I came across the novel out of order, I didn't listen to it at the time, but I always did mean to go back and uh, listen to the parts of your novel in order. Never got around to it though. So earlier this year, when you got around to posting your novel as uh, separate episodes within your podcast, I was very pleased, and even more pleased, when I uh, sat down and and listened to it all. Very good novel. If there's anybody out there listening uh, who hasn't listened to the novel yet, do it. It's great. And uh, I really need to look up the rest of uh, Steve's writing. Anyway, 
congratulations again on the podcast. Uh, congratulations on reaching your 200th episode. And I sincerely hope that uh, there will be a good many more just as good as what's gone before. Thanks. G'day, Steve. Barry Howarth from Brisbane, Australia here again, this time with some uh, thoughts about, uh, well, what I hope to see in the future as, uh, as we go, in, go further into the 21st century. Two areas. The first, energy technology. I'm very pleased with the sorts of developments that I'm seeing in uh, solar power especially and other renewable sources of energy. I've always been intrigued by solar power, always wanted to put solar panels on the roof, always wanted to have an electric car, but uh, these things have never, they've never been cheap enough to do, uh, or for that matter in the, in the case of electric cars they haven't been available at all, um, but that is changing. Solar panels and such are available, uh, still not quite cheap enough for me. I'm looking forward to them becoming uh, affordable within the next five years or so and uh, putting some on my roof, not to mention uh, electric cars. Probably by the time my kids have grown up and I don't need as, as big, a, big a car, I'll be able to afford an electric one and that should be a lot of fun. The other area of, of uh, interest for me is space technology. When I was uh, young, oh, about six or seven, NASA were landing men on the moon, and that was a, a great, um, something that excited me greatly and sparked, I don't know where, if it sparked my interest in science fiction or the other way around, but in any case, the, uh, both that and science fiction, of course, are very big parts of my childhood. And I was very excited in my, um, in my late teens when uh, NASA started flying the space shuttle. I was looking forward so much th to the promise of the space shuttle and uh, space for the rest of us, making access to space cheap and routine and, well, we all know what happened there, unfortunately. Now, of course, with the shuttle retiring, we're moving into a new era. We're moving into an era where there are, where there are other players getting into the space industry. Now, I know that this has happened before. Oh. Back in the 1990s, there was quite a lot of talk in space circles about uh, different uh, companies making their own launch vehicles, single stage to orbit and so on, and somehow it all just fizzled. This time around, I'm thinking not. The, uh, the likes of SpaceX, one of the latest new space companies, they seem to be making some uh, very substantial progress with their booster rockets. They are actually building rockets and launching them. And they have uh, signed contracts with NASA to deliver cargo to, and people to the space station. And that's something that's never happened before, and that's extremely exciting. But the most exciting part of it, of, of course, is that they are a private company. And although they're taking money from NASA and will be uh, delivering NASA astronauts to the, sh to the space station, um, they will also be um, delivering, taking up, up into space anybody that uh, comes along and gives them the right amount of money. And that's something that, when that happens, when that becomes routine, that is going to really change the way people think about space. And, is re uh, and I'm really looking forward to the developments that will follow from that. As for what will follow, well, it won't be very long before people go back to the moon, I'm quite sure. Space Adventures, the company that are behind uh, such space tourists as Dennis Tito and all the others that have gone to the International Space Station have said that uh, they've got one passenger at least who has signed up for a trip to the moon in a Soyuz rocket, not a landing on the moon but a, just a, a, uh, an Apollo 8 style whipping around the moon and back again and that uh, once they sign up a second person, which they expect to do pretty soon, they will uh, be setting that project going and probably it will be happening 2014, 2015, I think, was the figure that I heard. And that, too, is going to be a very exciting thing to see and should generate an awful lot of interest. What happens after that? Who knows? People will walk on the moon again before too much longer, I'm quite sure, and will go to other destinations, to the asteroids, and to Mars. Elon Musk, the uh, president of, uh, of uh, SpaceX, says that he said that he wants to retire on Mars. Maybe you should try and get him as an interview on the show. I'd love to hear what, uh, what he would have to say. Anyway, that's probably more than enough for me this time around. Um, again, I very much enjoyed your, uh, your podcast. Keep up the good work. The future looks like it'll be interesting. Bye. Next is Paul Fisher. 
Paul Fisher is an information technology professional and one of podcasting's pioneers. He and Martha Holloway are widely known for their Balticon podcast. Paul Fisher wrote, Steve, these are what I see in the future that I don't think anyone else has seen. I don't think you will ever need to delete another file ever again, and more importantly, companies which make money off your personal data like cell phone carriers, search engines, and, quote, free email providers will never delete another piece of data on you again. Today, you can purchase two terabytes of hard disk storage for $80 US. On sale, the same disks go for as low as $60. Three terabyte drives are on the market, and four terabyte drives are on their way. As these drives reach the marketplace, their prices will drop to well under $100. This will leave even poverty level people with far more disk space in new and used computers than they will ever use. Add to this the availability of always-on internet and unlimited usage plans, and computer operating system manufacturers will be looking for more and more ways to keep your data around longer and cache internet data on your local machine to increase the speedy feel of your internet use. This will leave gigabytes and gigabytes of your personal data trailing you through your life. Nothing will ever be thrown out, and unless we get a handle on the massive privacy implications of all this data, our children will have their whole lives exposed for everyone and anyone to see. You will be tracked, tagged, and measured without your knowledge and consent by corporations, governments, and individuals from the time you start using a computer until the time you die. Attempts to anonymize this data will meet with failure as they do today. This will leave our children explaining at age 50 about the love letters and obsessions they had with pop music, TV, and movie stars that they had in their teens. Nothing will be left behind, the good, the bad, and the fascinatingly ugly. Grid computing, generally considered a scientific tool, will become the norm of daily life. Grid computing is the splitting apart of tasks and allowing them to run on heterogeneous hardware across a network. Tasks like folding molecules, processing raw signal data, and even converting video files do not rely on the previous set of data processed to work on the next set. They are asynchronous computing tasks. With the advent of the Intel Core series of chips, Core i3, i5, and i7, the average person is now being handed a multi-core computer at even the cheapest of computers. We purchased some cheap office computers recently, and those $500 machines came with four cores. Higher-end machines are available with 8, 12, 16, and 24 cores. They are cheap, fast, and efficient. However, today most software will not take advantage of more than one core. In the near future, 5 to 10 years, Every software engineer and coder coming out of school will be taught how to break down software tasks to split them across multiple cores and complete the task that much sooner. Corporations and governments will invest in processing huge data sets across their IT infrastructure to take advantage of the massive amount of computing power available on the desktop machines which go unused during the course of a day. Improbably complex problems will be solved cheaply and efficiently, just utilizing the excess CPU capacity on users' desktops. Some corporations, like Merck, the pharmaceutical giant, already do grid processing on their desktop IT machines when those machines enter screensaver mode. When the incremental cost of jumping from 4 cores to 8 cores is less than $200, IT departments will choose more and then utilize those extra cores. In effect, they will be building themselves cheap, easy-to-run, and efficient grid supercomputers. Additional tasks that lend themselves to grid computing are rendering animations, rendering visualization data, and, quote, gaming social problems such as simplifying the tax code as proposed by sci-fi author and futurist David Brin. In parentheses, he provides a link, which you can find if you do a search for the phrase, no losers tax simplification proposal. And Paul closes with, I'm preparing for Balticon today. I wish you could make it to Balticon. Maybe next year. Please keep up the show. I love it. And it's signed, Paul Fisher. The next one's from Kathy Smith. 
She is a insect geneticist. Congrats on the 200th episode. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. My prediction for the future is that genetic modification and other types of biotechnology will combine with nanotechnology. It will be a while, it will be a while yet, but I predict the two fields will come together and work to overcome the shortcomings of the other. I can see where, instead of injecting an organism with genetically modified plasmids and hoping that it inserts the sequence, someone will be able to inject some nanobots and the desired genetic sequence. The nanobots will ferry the sequence to the nucleus and insert it, whether or not it takes is a different matter. This directed insertion could lead to a much higher rate of success. As of now, the success rate hovers around 10% for fruit flies. That was from Kathy Smith. The next one is from Michael D. Ambrosio, author and screenwriter. Hi, Stephen. I think we'll be living as colonies on ships in the not-too-distant future. This will be driven by problems on Earth like war, global economic issues, terrorism, and climate change, just an enlarged version of today's issues. Next is Tim Bolgio, whose last name I may be mispronouncing because I never call him that. I call him Uncle Timmy, as does everyone at LibertyCon. He's an electrical engineer and the founder of LibertyCon. Uncle Timmy wrote, Prediction 1. I predict that the U.S. and the world will wake up one day and find out they are without enough power to heat and cool their homes and that a number of older people have died because of it. Prediction 2. At that point, the government will step in to ration the power they get. When they really start to look into how they got that way, they will find out that the bottom of the pyramid are the, quote, earth shoe and granola, unquote, liberals who have been trying to force reusable choices on us for the last 30 to 40 years. Prediction 3. At that point in time, the U.S. and all of the rest of the industrial powers of the world who never woke up will start building nuclear power plants in a frantic effort to keep their populations from revolting because of the government stupidity of the past. Those are my predictions, and they're based on common sense and observation over the past 40 years. It should be mentioned that uh, Uncle Timmy is a, an electrical engineer who worked for the TVA and spent pretty much his entire career working with power plants and the, the production of power on a large scale, feeding into the electric grid. I can't say whether or not his predictions are accurate, but I can say that it is the field that he works in that he's predicting about. Next, Brian Bishop, futurist and public speaker. He wrote, Sorry, but the world is ending today and there is no future to predict. He was being facetious, of course, but for those of you who have not heard, a preacher somewhere predicted the rapture would occur Saturday, May 21, 2011. As an atheist, I am obligated to ridicule preachers. At least that's what the thought police tell me. So here's my best shot. Though I am an atheist, even I know that Jesus said, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Presumably, this preacher is the only preacher on earth who has not read the book of Matthew. Okay, it wasn't really very mean. I guess ridiculing people for their beliefs is not my strong point. Next is James Maxey. He's the author of the Dragon Age fantasy series, as well as a novel called Nobody Gets the Girl. He wrote, I actually got your message on Facebook Wednesday and have been racking my brain trying to think of a prediction that isn't either mundane or already come to pass. I actually had a prediction I thought was going to come in the next five years, which is that smartphones would start having biometrics built in to secure them. They'd be built to recognize the user's fingerprints and would lock out everyone else. And then on Thursday, one of my coworkers showed me a new cell phone that had just came out, and it had the fingerprint recognition built in. Suddenly, my prediction of the future became a prediction of the past, which isn't nearly as challenging. Anyway, I'm still hoping for inspiration. Stay tuned. That was from James Maxey. A day or two later, James Maxey wrote me again. Steve, I've been racking my brain trying to come up with a future trend that isn't either trivial or cliché. Alas, I fear I keep coming back to the well-worn path of a dystopian future. For years, I've been swinging back and forth on the question, will tomorrow be better or worse? arguing for a better tomorrow, are increasing freedom of information and increased understanding of the material world. 
We are heading for a future in which bodies may be fine-tuned to cure all ills, and the physical properties of matter are so well understood that we can craft wondrous machines using fewer and fewer resources. What I fear about the future is that almost anything a man can do today, in the future, a machine will do better. Machines will mow our lawns, educate our children, mop our floors, build our buildings, diagnose our ills, and drive us around town. They will take and prepare our food orders in restaurants, grow our crops, and fit us for new pants, which will be sewn by machines. For most of human history, people who lack the drive or intellect to pursue higher education could make a living by providing mobility and limited intellect for machines. A high school dropout could drive a taxi, push a lawnmower, or operate a printing press, but human labor is increasingly expensive and unreliable compared to machine labor. A human driving a lawnmower will want to take a break every hour or so. A robot lawnmower can operate non-stop. Once, a human was needed to make sure the lawnmower didn't run over stray toys or crawling babies. Tomorrow, the sensors and software needed to prevent such tragedies will cost less than the fuel it takes to drive a human operator to the worksite. In theory, the rise of machine labor will free up mankind for higher-level thinking, people will be more free to be musicians, artists, philosophers, and politicians. In practice, I fear that we will create a permanent underclass of people with no real skills that contribute to a modern economy. People who are innately ambitious will have nearly endless opportunities to pursue their dreams, but large swaths of humanity will have nothing to do with their lives except survive on government handouts and breed. We will wind up with social stratification between the ultra-educated, ultra-wealthy, and an idle underclass that will be entertained, fed, and sheltered, but completely unproductive. Again, I'm hardly the first person to warn of this possibility. I hope that there are trends I'm missing that can save us from this future. I just fear that most humans, if given the option, will choose leisure over labor any day. And it's signed, James Maxey. Robert Hooker, an information technology professional living in London, wrote, Predictions in the near term, and he's numbered them. 1. Microsoft will become mostly a cloud company, delivering most of its flagship products like Office, SharePoint, Outlook, and now Skype, VoIP, via the internet and not installed software. 2. The PC and laptop computer will be almost non-existent in 10 years' time, replaced by handheld tablets and smartphones. 3. Within 15 years, the term Internet will completely fall out of use. This will be because the Internet will be so pervasive that to speak of it would be like speaking of language or culture. The only people who will speak about the Internet will be academic experts who study it in ivory towers. For everyone else, the Internet simply will just be. 4. The free market reforms introduced during the rules of Reagan and Thatcher will continue to spiral into boom and bust and will lead to a massive re-regulation and re-socialization in the next 10 years. 5. Android will overtake Mac OS X as the number two laptop operating system in the next four years. 6. Rather than reforming and modernizing, China is headed for a period of intense Stalinist repression, which will be the worst oppression seen since Mao's Cultural Revolution. Not only will dissident artists be arrested, but a large number of loyal communists who simply wanted reform will serve long, harsh terms, and many will die. 7. The Arab world will become a major social media outsourcing center, especially Egypt. This will be due to a combination of a high number of young digital natives, compared to the West, and experience using social media in the Jasmine Revolution. Uh, let me step out of his email for a minute. The Jasmine Revolution he's referring to is the, uh, which is called by many media organizations, was the impetus of the 2010-2011 Middle East and North Africa protests, which is sometimes referred to as uh, Arab Spring or the Arab Spring. Of protests. Okay, back into the uh, email. Number eight. The Jasmine Revolution is in fact a generation change combined with the most massive communication technology change since language first emerged. 
It will spread globally and will be an ongoing conflict in almost all nations between older population and the young who have grown up with the internet and free market globalization. Note that the old who grew up under more regulated times and are more likely to have pensions and union members will oppose these benefits going to the younger generation. That is, the older generations will struggle to keep the younger generations in freer markets and more global competition, while they themselves fight to protect their own entitlements and protections. We saw this with the Tea Party, which was, don't touch my Medicare, screw everyone else, and Spain, where unions and socialists find the young protesting against them. 9. The current investors' love of the BRIC economies is headed for a major crisis as structural problems in India, China, Russia, and Brazil lead to a series of major shocks. 10. Global warming in the USA will hit the Bible Belt the hardest, where it will be seen as evidence of God's wrath and lead to even more radical right-wing ideology. Those predictions were from Robert Hooker. Next is David Drake author of over 60 novels of science fiction and fantasy. He is widely considered to be one of the premier authors of the military science fiction subgenre. By the way, for relaxation, he translates ancient books from the Roman Empire from the original Latin into English, many of which can be read for free on his website. He wrote, Dear Stephen, I expect direct conversion of petroleum to edible carbohydrates in the foreseeable future. Note that this has nothing to do with the U.S. practice of growing corn with diesel tractors to convert into ethanol of enormously less potential energy. Farming, as now practiced in the developed and developing world, involves the use of diesel tractors to grow and harvest crops. This is extremely inefficient compared to using the energy in petroleum directly for food. While direct conversion is only a stopgap, it considerably delays the point at which we run out of petroleum and most human beings die. I hope this works for you. Dave. Charlie Strauss, Hugo Award-winning hard science fiction author of novels such as Accelerando and Singularity Sky, he wrote, One prediction that's almost always going to be true. The future is just like the past, only different. We overestimate short-term change and underestimate long-term change. The result is that the near future, 10, 20, 30 years out, resembles the present only with added decorations around the edges. Fashions change, and every so often a new technology erupts on the scene and turns some aspect of society upside down. Antibiotics in the 1940s, plastics in the 1950s, PCs in the 1980s, cell phones in the 1990s, and of course, the internet but the overall appearance of society changes much more slowly, which can lead to interesting misapprehensions. Take a time traveler from 1960 and plop them down in the same city today, and chances are that if they're in the USA or the EU, they'll mostly be able to orient themselves within the first 15 minutes. The buildings and architectural types will be recognizable, clothes, well, nobody's wearing hats, and there are a lot of women in trousers and people in casual wear, and the cars all look a bit melted and bobbly, but this stuff is all ephemeral. Televisions look as flat and colorful and the same shape as cinema screens, but it's still TV. The only obviously weird thing is the way people are walking around with wires in their ears, peering into these glowing card deck sized things, and animatedly holding conversations with themselves. And what are all those weird codes on advertising billboards that begin with www about? These time travelers don't notice the cameras everywhere until it's too late. After all, in 1960, a color TV camera was too heavy to lift. And he signed it, Charlie. Next is Nancy Cress, Hugo, an award-winning author of hard science fiction, such as her novel, Beggars in Spain. She tends to write technically realistic stories set in a fairly near future, which often involve genetic engineering and, to a lesser degree, artificial intelligence. She wrote... I predict a decline in physical, portable credit cards, and especially debit cards. The information on them is becoming too easy to steal as thieves develop ever more sophisticated systems for data heisting. 
Even now, the news has reported readers that quickly fit over the store checkout scanners and steal the information inside, as well as readers that can lift the data from the cards in your wallet as you stroll down the street. In the not-too-distant future, we will need a credit system with better encryption, less vulnerability, and possibly no physical artifact to carry around. And what the financial sector needs, it usually gets. That was from Nancy Kress. Next is Hilde Silverman, publisher of Space and Time magazine, which means she is one of my many bosses. Her prediction relates to her former job as editor for Achieving Families magazine, the, and I quote, only magazine dedicated to providing real-life informative stories and articles to guide you through the challenges of infertility. She was more than just one of its editors, however. She's a living example of how science and technology are bringing the joy of childbearing to those who would otherwise be left out. Her daughter was conceived through technological intervention. Her prediction for the future. With the technology for freezing eggs already vastly improved and only getting better, you will see a lot more women deferring motherhood until their 40s or even later. Women will be able to have full careers first, then become mothers and enjoy the fullness of that experience too, rather than splitting themselves between work and raising kids. New laws will hit the books based on advances in reproductive technology. The legal issues have already arisen with regards to custody battles over frozen sperm, ova, and embryos. The law will catch up, setting guidelines that clarify parental rights and other tricky issues. That was from Hilde Silverman. Next is Michael Vassar, president of the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence. He is also responsible for the organization of the annual conference known as the Singularity Summit. His prediction, In the greatest generation, the smart and foresighted expected to be able to plan for the future by counting on defined benefit pensions. Clueful boomers knew those were bunk, but thought that they could count on college degrees, social security, Medicare, and respectable careers. Gen X knew better, but believed in 401k plans and graduate or engineering degrees. For Gen Y, Ivy degrees, real estate, good credit ratings, and jobs at least seemed real, but the next generation is only going to believe that they can secure their future with Facebook friends, real friends, couch surfing ratings, and other reputation currencies, real skills, real achievements, and cold cash until they change their minds and stop believing in cash. That was from Michael Vassar. Next is Randall L. Schwartz. Since his prediction is about programming, it might be good to mention that his career has included his being a computer programmer, a system administrator, an author of technical books and numerous magazine articles and columns on how to program in specific languages, he is currently a member of the Squeak Oversight Board, which oversees the Squeak programming language. And he is the host of Floss Weekly, a podcast which serves the free and open source software programming community. In other words, he knows computer programming inside and out. He has worked in it at every level. It is his life. He wrote, Summary. I predict that within the next 40 years, we will find a way to go back to analog with computing systems to eliminate the von Neumann bottleneck and the Nyquist sampling overhead. We will build massively parallel computing systems that interface directly as analog signals and fire with analog trainable circuits, mimicking the brain's natural evolution-driven design. Detail. The brain doesn't think synchronously digitally in a matter that can be single-stepped to be debugged. Yet every digital system we design can be debugged like that, limiting our ability to mimic nature's computing design. Sure, we can try to build more and more parallel systems with faster components, computing digitally what is often more naturally represented as a signal level. But at some point, the steam of this engine will run out. Once we can give up the idea, very hard as a programmer, of debugging the programming by single-stepping and work on more holistic programming and debugging techniques, we will be free to build systems matching and beating the complexity of the human brain. This is a necessary precursor to the singularity. The singularity will not happen without it, I say. That's from Randall L. Schwartz. Next is David B. Coe, 
award-winning author of epic fantasy novels such as his Lon Tobin Chronicle. He also wrote Robin Hood, a novelization of the movie directed by Ridley Scott, starring Russell Crowe and Kate Blanchett. His prediction. Global climate change, which too many people still doubt is even real, is impacting our planet so forcefully, so much faster than anyone predicted, it boggles the mind. My prediction? Within the next two years, the major ice shelves in the Arctic and Antarctic will fail catastrophically, inundating low-lying areas with seawater, forcing salt water into freshwater rivers and ecosystems, and destroying billions upon billions of dollars in private and public property. The United States and other industrialized nations will suddenly be forced to make policy decisions that should have been made years ago and that should have been implemented over the course of decades rather than months. The economic and social dislocation will be staggering. And the deniers will still claim, without proof or logic, that human activity had nothing to do with it. That's from David B. Coe. Next is Are You Serious? Editor of H Plus Magazine, which means another of my several bosses. He wrote, Sometime, we will either have a full-on global economic collapse, or we'll have a long boom that's substantial enough to paper over our debt-based economic difficulties. Either way, whether through desperation or through the privilege of being comfortable and being able to act on our desires, the main future economic activity of most people will be transparent, open-source, voluntary collaboration. Profit-based and state-based activities will continue, but they will slowly recede. This is the natural result of a technologically advanced, networked society, but it will require either a breakdown or a breakthrough to help us make the shift. Thanks, Stephen. That was Are You Serious? Next is Kevin J. Anderson, best-selling author of many Star Wars novels and the Dune prequels. He also serves as a judge in the Writers of the Future contest. Hi, Stephen. Hmm, a prediction. I suspect that everything I predict will happen faster than I predict it will. We're seeing a breathtaking and scary shift in the publishing industry in just the past year, as ebooks have finally hit their critical mass, and old guard publishers aren't agile enough to react in time. I predict I will make very little money selling all those old DVDs I have on the shelf. I didn't make any money selling all the old VHS tapes or all my vinyl albums. And I predict the really stupid shows on TV will still have better ratings than the very engaging ones. And then he makes a little sad face at the end of that sentence. And it's signed, Kevin J. Anderson. Next is Amara D. Angelica, co-founder and editor of KurzweilAI.net and its daily Accelerating Intelligence newsletter. She was editor and researcher for two of Ray Kurzweil's books, The Singularity is Near and Fantastic Voyage. And she's the academic model-slash-curriculum lead for Singularity University. Her prediction. I think we will see a mind-to-mind-to-computer system within five years that will erase the boundaries. It will probably involve electromagnetic coupling along the lines of the CEMI theory, and it's signed Amara D. Angelica. For those unfamiliar with CEMI theory, its starting point is the fact that every time a neuron fires to generate an action potential and a postsynaptic potential in the next neuron down the line, it also generates a disturbance in the surrounding electromagnetic field. So it's been proposed that the brain's electromagnetic field creates a representation of the information in the neurons. If this is so, it means we can detect that information non-invasively from outside the brain by measuring and decoding these electromagnetic fields. Wikipedia has a nice explanation if you'd like more info. Just search for CEMI theory. Next is Gail Martin. Gail Martin is the author of the Chronicles of the Necromancer series of fantasy novels. She writes, Hi Steve, great to hear from you. Here is my prediction. The ability to stay closely connected to people via social media type vehicles will transform our individual network web of relationships. People who embrace this technology and are savvy about how they use it will be able to mobilize a more effective personal and professional support community than those who don't. 
as the first power users of social media, today's teenagers, move forward, they will carry this web of warm relationships with them as an ever-growing, constantly nurtured personal village which will impact everything from health to career to family. We will really see the societal impact of these pioneer villagers in ten or so years. Thanks, Gail. That was Gail Martin. Next is Philip van Nederveld, international spokesperson for the Lifeboat Foundation and executive director for Europe of the Foresight Nanotech Institute. He provides five different predictions. First, eyeglasses are next, and he spells eyeglasses like uh, iPhone. The next major new form factor for mobile connectivity devices will have the form of glasses. They will have everything on board, in the frames, etc., that is found in today's newest high-end smartphones, plus eye tracking, high-resolution augmented reality, and high-fidelity virtual reality capabilities. After that, the next wave may be BCI implants with transdermal ports and eventually fully subdermal and subcranial implants. Second prediction, humans will become mobile sensors. Increasing mobile hyperconnectivity will lead to human beings also fulfilling the role of mobile sensors thereby providing a hypothetic global brain with a hypersensorium of at least 7 billion mobile sensors. Third prediction. Connectedness equals humanity. Increasing mobile hyperconnectivity will lead to, quote, being connected, being synonymous with, quote, being human. Unconnectedness will become viewed as dysfunctional, suspect, and indicative of inferiority in several respects. Expect unconnectism, like racism, ageism, and sexism. It will be a way to negatively discriminate. Fourth prediction. New mental disorders. The era of always-on hyperconnectivity will result in deeply new forms of mental dysfunction. Extreme connectivity addiction will pathologize into a fully-fledged new mental disease. This new disease may also somatize in the form of debilitating neural diseases, degrading areas of the brain and the human nervous system systematically, and may become colloquially known as brain rot or nerve rot or neural rot. In extreme cases, once it passes a certain threshold, it leads to death. Fifth prediction. Neural prostheses pave the way to gradual uploading. The first neural prosthesis will replace the hippocampus and help people with memory problems. Later neural prosthesis will replace other parts of the brain. Eventually, all parts of the brain will be replaceable with neural prosthesis, thereby affecting uploading by gradual substrate transfer in the style of the ancient ship of Theseus parable. That was by Philip van Netterveld. Uh, those not familiar with the, the parable, the short version is... If a ship travels around the world on a, on a very great adventure and voyage, and it experiences a lot of damage during the course of the trip, so that the boards of the ship are, over a period of many repairs, all replaced, so that when the ship returns to its home port, not one board is of the original ship. Is it the same ship, or is it a different ship? That is to say, is the identity, so to speak, of an object dependent on its physical continuity as a active device, a, a utilitarian device, or is the identity based on its substance, its material substance, what it's made out of, rather than its contiguous existence and activity and use. It's an ancient parable. Next is Dale Baker, a listener. Dale wrote, Stephen, my suggestion for best interview is biased toward my own selfishness. Your best interview is the first I heard, Werner Vinge. Vinge has been a hero of mine since I was a junior high school student when a friend's older brother gave me a copy of The Peace War. I've been a devotee ever since. His stories have never failed to engage and provoke thought. I heard his interview first because I was searching Pod Nova, sadly no longer available, for podcasts featuring Vinge or discussions about him and his work. The Future in You was one of several podcasts that featured Vinge, 
but yours was the only one that kept me coming back for more interesting discussions, convention panels, and editorials. Your novel, Bones Burnt Black, was a significant contributor to keeping my interest as well. Since then, I've come to appreciate many of the authors you've brought to the show. Pohl, Niven, Bear, Pornell, Bryn, Drake, Ringo, and many others of excellent quality. He puts in parentheses, Scalzi and Card should be in that list, too. Even with so many good shows, Vinge remains my favorite, partly because every novel is a must-read, and it was my introduction to your podcast, your writing, and many others' work. Thank you for keeping the future in you going for the last six years. Your dedication to informing us about what is just around the corner is appreciated. Signed, Dale. Uh, as a side note, the show hasn't quite been going for six years. It started in 2005 and has been going now for, well, since December 15 of 2005. So that would be five and a half years. Next up, the very person Dale was talking about, Werner Vinge. He is a professor of mathematics, computer scientist, and Hugo Award-winning hard science fiction author. He didn't invent the idea of the singularity, but his 1993 essay, The Coming Technological Singularity, was pivotal in defining, explaining, and naming what we now call the singularity. Werner Vinge wrote, Hi, Steve. No one knows the future, so I hesitate to use the word prediction. I think plausible, possible scenarios are more fun. And here is one, on the road to one form of the technological singularity. Social networking becomes dominated by bottom-up forces rather than the top-down organization of our present. Imagine free software for managing user-created, peer-to-peer social networks. Commerce would be as important as ever, but it would be driven by the customers directly. The size of such networks could range from two people to billions. At the smallest end, the cooperation might be between differently able persons, say one mobile and one not. Larger sizes would exist with varied architecture and purposes from benign to dangerous. I rant on this at greater length in, and he gives a, a link here. It's a bit complicated, but if you search for, well, let me try spelling it out. It's HTTP colon slash slash standard format. R-O-H-A-N dot S-D-S-U dot E-D-U forward slash faculty, which is F-A-C-U-L-T-Y forward slash Vinge, which is spelled V-I-N-G-E forward slash capital C and the numeral five forward slash index dot H-T-M. That's from Werner Vinge. Wayne Rooney, a listener from New Zealand, wrote, Hello, Stephen. Congratulations on reaching 200 episodes, and may the good work continue. I have listened to them all, and indeed I do recommend them to my friends. Signed, Wayne Rooney, in New Zealand. Larry Bowman, a listener and one of my buddies that I actually get to see frequently, he wrote, Cars may become completely electronic in this decade, but the biggest trucks on the road won't. 18-wheeled tractor trailers weigh 40 tons when fully loaded, and even with today's powerful diesel engines, they lose a lot of speed going up a mountain highway. With nothing but an electric motor, even if on every wheel, they wouldn't have the power. They would slow down to a complete stop at the bottom of the mountain and be stuck there. And there are a lot of mountains in the U.S. Signed, Larry Bowman. Next, Joseph Sullivan, another listener and one of my buddies that I actually get to see frequently. He writes... Cloud services will force the redesigns of most portable devices, cell phones, tablets, medical devices, etc. Thanks for the podcast, Stephen. You rock. And that was from Joe Sullivan. Next is Charlie Cam, a singer-songwriter and entrepreneur, as well as member of the World Transhumanist Association, Immortalist Institute, World Future Society, Singularity Institute, and Alcor. Aside from having lunch with him and Rudy Hoffman, the world's foremost cryonic insurance salesman, while I was covering the Singularity Summit in New York City a couple of years ago, I know Charlie because he wrote and sang in the YouTube video the song I Am the Very Model of a Singularitarian, which if you are a Singularitarian, or just Singularitarian curious, you need to Google and watch. It's pretty darn cool. His prediction. Well, it depends on how far into the future you are talking about. 
there are all sorts of fun and interesting predictions that will come true in the next 30 years that we can calculate. Example, full immersion, virtual reality, etc. But if Kurzweil is correct in his timetable prediction of exponential acceleration of technological change, then I predict that the changes that are coming for humans at the time of the singularity, around 2045, will be so profound that they will dwarf ineffectual magnitude any of the predicted changes that occur between now and that time. We will transform ourselves from a biological composition into a fully technological one that is almost unrecognizable to us currently. One crude comparison that comes to mind is that of a single cell of our body to that of our whole body. A single cell has the potential to become an entire human body, but in its state as an individual cell, it has no comprehension of what humanity as a whole can ultimately achieve. And that's signed, Charlie Cam. Next is Dr. Anders Sandberg, computational neuroscientist, futurist, transhumanist, and author. He is a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute, the Faculty of Philosophy at Oxford University, and he is a former chairman of the Swedish Transhumanist Association. His prediction. Computers are not only getting faster and cheaper, but also more energy efficient. There are going to be sensors and smarts in nearly every object, and they will be able to remember what they are, which is good for recycling, who owns them, and what they have experienced. Thanks to smartphones, the Internet of Things, and their successors, we will document everything we do and experience. Some people deliberately use their life recordings to improve their memories and sense of self. In parentheses, he writes, How often do I go to this restaurant? How many calories do I really eat? Unparentheses. Others will not notice that they are storing their entire lives online until they get deleted. Somebody copies them, or they are surprised by ads that know their whole lives. The future is going to be far richer than the present, although we won't feel super rich. It is just that individuals will be able to do and experience more things than we presently can and take it for granted. As people become rich enough, they also become increasingly post-materialistic. But don't you dare mess with their global wireless experience systems or medicines. And I believe that's a purposeful portamento of the word medicine and machine. He spelled it M-E-D-I-C-H-I-N-E-S. Or it could have been a typo, in which he was trying to type the word medicine. Biohacking is going to become a hot topic across the 2010s and onward as people start doing biotech on their own. Design your own houseplants, or make your own drug-producing gut bacteria. No doubt there will be some big biotech scares as a few experiments go visibly astray. People are going to be able to sequence their own DNA, and of their neighbors and celebrities, no matter what the authorities say they are allowed to do. In the long run, humanity has a decent chance of speciating into new, widely different species. Some people will refuse all the weird technology. Others will use it to enhance themselves, beauty, long life, smarts, health, into small Greek gods. Others will change much more radically. What is more punk than becoming your own species? Some going post-human by copying their minds into computers or forming various kinds of cyborg symbiosis with technology. Tolerance is going to be an important commodity in the future. And he closed with, hope these are fun. That was from Dr. Anders Sandberg. Next is Davy Beauchamp, author, anthologist, and professional librarian, and a buddy I don't get to see very often. He covers something I've been worried about a lot lately, the potential death of public libraries due to rising ebook popularity. His prediction of the future. I am going to predict on the aspect of libraries and what they must become in order to survive. Libraries are going to become what they once were, community centers. It will become a place where people from the community can gather and explore new ideas and information. They will become places for people to learn new skills, mostly basic skills involving day-to-day -day technology. I don't think books will become a big thing of the past, but more a special collection as digital media becomes more and more relevant. Apple really changed the landscape with the advent of the iPad along with the help of the Amazon Kindle. Librarians themselves are going to have to embrace these new technologies to continue to be relevant in this ever-changing world of information. Because what librarians have always seemed to be are keepers of information. 
People need guidance to real information and not information that is filled with half-truths and lies. And that was from Davy Beauchamp. Next is Timothy Zahn, New York Times best-selling hard science fiction author, possibly best known for his Thrawn trilogy, which is a series of Star Wars novels set in the time after the movie Return of the Jedi. He wrote, Hi, Steve. Good to hear from you again, and congratulations on your upcoming 200th show. As requested, here's my prediction. Many European nations, along with Canada, have the single-payer socialized medicine system where high medical costs are often replaced by long waiting lines, particularly for unpleasant but non-critical treatment. Currently, the U.S. acts as a safety valve for those systems, where those who can afford the costs can come to get their knee replacements or whatever done on a more timely basis. But if the U.S. also goes to this system, what happens then? Do people in pain who don't want to wait have to go to Manila or Grenada to get their operations? I predict that the Mexican government, seeing the chance to make a more figurative killing, will finally sweep the drug lords out of a 10-mile stretch of their northern border and set up a medical zone where clinics and hospitals will provide this sort of service. Many of the facilities will be staffed by former U.S. medical folk who found themselves crushed between decreased pay, unchanged malpractice insurance costs, and rising bureaucratic nonsense. In parentheses, he put, because bureaucratic nonsense always rises. Bonus prediction. The Indian casinos here in the U.S. will invoke sovereignty to set up similar medical facilities independent of government rules and regulations. They will also finally start selling gas with the federal taxes on them. Expect a big legal fight over that one. Also expect long lines of cars. I think he meant without the federal taxes on them. At any rate, he closes with, I hope that's helpful and useful. I'm not really in the prediction business. Let me know if you need anything else. Once again, congrats on the past and best wishes for your future. Best, Tim. That was from Timothy Zahn. Next is Sarah A. Hoyt. Today, she is a science fiction and fantasy author, but she started her career as a professional translator because she spoke six languages. She claims she's not as fluent in some of them now, but she's still a bit of a polyglot. Born in Porto, Portugal, but living in Denver, Sarah travels frequently between the two locations to visit family, so she knows a good bit about long-distance travel. Here is her prediction. I believe the most significant trend of the future will be not just greater ease of travel between continents and lands, though that will be there too, but the great global village that is the Internet and the fact that people from everywhere will rub elbows in it. When I was young, I was an exchange student via AFS, an organization that believed that if people around the world knew each other better, they'd fight less. This flew in the face of all the civil wars and neighbor wars throughout history. So I don't think that knowing each other better will stop wars. On the contrary, I think it will cause some wars, and those will be as brutal as civil wars in the past. But I also think it will facilitate, eventually, in a hundred years or so, a kind of worldwide culture that will facilitate the sharing of knowledge and the development of science, not to mention the universalization of truly strange hashtags like pound tiger blood and pound duh winning. That was from Sarah A. Hoyt. Next is Rich Siegfried, better known as Podcasting's Rich Siegfried. He is a podcaster, entertainer, and comedian. Rich Siegfried is one of the three people who, back in 2005, explained to me what a podcast was and encouraged me to try my hand at doing one. The other two were T. Morris and Murr Lafferty. His prediction takes a more humorous look at the future. He wrote, Well, it looks like we survived the most recent apocalypse, i.e. the rapture that was supposed to take place on the 21st. Or we didn't and we're the poor lot stuck behind in which case I welcome our Satan-worshipping giant locust overlords. I remember the last apocalypse, Y2K. Personally, I thought the Furbies were going to rise up and enslave us all. Think about it. They had their own language that children were forced to learn if they wanted to communicate with them. Adults have no idea what plans they were discussing. Is it so hard to believe that children couldn't have a rebellion against those of us who have held cookies just out of their grasp or forced them to go to bed long before the cool shows aired? led by Mary-Kate and Ashley Olson. Keep in mind, this was the beginning of the 2000s. 
It didn't happen, and neither will the end of the Mayan calendar throw us into a post-apocalyptic future where time has ended and Bill and Ted are our new kings. Although I do believe, after that calendar ends, we are officially in the Willennium. Once inside our brave new future, many trends that people have taken either for granted or overlooked will slowly come to reality. Many of us listening are content creators. I believe we're a year or two away from online content being streamed to our televisions without extra peripherals. The Apple TV was the first step, Netflix streaming built into TVs the next. We're close to our grandparents being able to listen to podcasts by using the same remote they find Pat Sajak and Oprah. Then podcasters will take control of the world back from the locust conquerors. That's from Rich Siegfried. And there you have it. That's all the predictions. And what a variety they are. Thank you to all who participated. Great stuff. I hope I didn't miss anyone that sent something in. My inbox is starting to look like a war zone. And if you missed getting your prediction in, well, with a little luck, in two years, I hope to be doing another special show for the 300th episode. In the meantime, if you send me a prediction before then, I'll just read it into one of the regular weekly episodes. By the way, if you found some of these people's ideas interesting and want to hear more from them, keep in mind that all past episodes of this show remain available for your downloading enjoyment, and many of these people have been guests on the show, some several times. If you'd like to learn more about me, you can go to my website, stevecobb.com. That's spelled S-T-E-V-E-C-O-B-B dot com. Or search for my full name, Stephen Ewan Cobb, which is spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Ewan, E-U-I-N, Cobb, C-O-B-B. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with all your friends. Thank you. That's it for this episode of The Future and You. This program is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 2.5 license. A copy of this license may be viewed at creativecommons.org. Briefly, this means you may, indeed you are encouraged to, copy this entire program as many times as you wish and give it away to as many people as you wish. But you may not copy only a portion of this program, you may not charge anyone any amount of money for it, and you may not use any portion of it to make something new. On the other hand, anyone whose obvious goal is to recommend the show to others automatically gets special dispensation. Offline reviews, which include the show's website, may include brief quotes. And online reviews, such as for a blog or community group or web page, which provide a conspicuous link to the show's website, may use as many quotes as they wish, up to and including a transcript of one half of any interview. The show's theme music is a blues number called Some Sympathy by Chris Jurgensen, and is from his album Big Bad Sun, which is available at magnatune.com. Magnatune is an independent record label that sells its catalog of music through online downloads and print-on-demand CDs. The company allows artists to retain full rights to their music and splits equally with an artist all the revenue from the sale of their work. All the music at Magnatune may be previewed free of charge and customers can even choose how much they want to pay for the music with pricing ranging from $5 to $18 per album. You can learn more about them at magnatune.com. That's spelled M-A-G-N-A-T-U-N-E dot com. If you have a theory or opinion about what the future will contain, be it the near future or the far future, you may email it to me at thefutureandyou.com. That's M-E at symbol thefutureandyou.com. You may also suggest topics that you would like to hear discussed or send contact information for experts that you feel might provide valuable insights into the future. Mind you, an expert is not necessarily someone with an impressive degree. The best experts are the people who live or work or strive in the area under discussion. If the subject is science or medicine or academia, a degree is important. But if the discussion concerns trends in construction or firefighting or video gaming, a degree is pretty much meaningless. To get the inside dope, you've got to find the people who actually do this stuff every day. They are the first to see the trends because the trends have already begun changing their lives. As to the topics we will explore in the next episode of The Future and You, I can make no guarantees. 
interviews are still being sought, recorded, and edited. All I can promise is that we will ruminate on the future. To learn more, check the show's website at thefutureandyou.com. If you enjoyed the program, please mention it to a friend, and be sure to join me again next time. Until then, I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of myself and all my guests, I thank you for listening.